Okay, welcome everyone to module four. So uh, this module will follow along pretty nicely from what uh, Jared presented to you guys. Uh, it's about one of the most important effects of genome rearrangements, which is uh, gene fusion, one of very important events in cancer. So we're going to talk about uh, these events and how to detect them. So here's an outline of our objectives for what we're going to learn. Uh, we'll explore the impact of gene fusions in cancer, learn about the different types of evidence that uh, we'll be looking for when we're predicting these events. We'll try to understand uh, the differences between the different available detection methods and tools, uh, understand how to identify false positives, which are, it's, this is an important aspect of uh, being able to understand these data sets because they're often replete with false positives. Um, and then we'll look a little bit about assessing a gene fusion's potential function. So to, just to give a uh, broad definition of a gene fusion, it's a novel gene formed by the fusion of two distinct wild-type genes. Uh, the canonical example here is uh, BCR-ABL, which was, is, is probably the first uh, somatic event that was found in any uh, cancer that was attributed to the cancer biology. Uh, originally, it was found uh, as something called the Philadelphia chromosome, discovered by Noel and Hungerford in Philadelphia, hence the name. Um, and then later, they found that this, this translocation actually fused the BCR and ABL genes and produced this gene fusion. They're relevant in cancer as prognostic markers. Uh, here are our, our, our CML, or sorry, our BCR ABL example. Um, it's a prognostic marker for 90 to 95% of CML patients. Uh, BCR ABL1 is a, also a, uh, a success for story for being able to drug uh, the target drugs towards these gene fusions because we can now target the gene fusion with imitinib. And I think one of the reasons for a resurgence in excitement about gene fusions is the newly available sequencing platforms that make it easier to identify these events. Uh, the evidence that these are important events in cancer are uh, they correlate with the cancer phenotype, hence why they're such good uh, prognostic markers in some uh, subtypes of cancer. Successful treatment of uh, cancer will often eradicate any evidence of the gene fusion. So if we treat, for, uh, treat CML with imitinib, then we can no longer detect the Philadelphia chromosome in the, uh, the patient's blood. Uh, gene fusions. Uh, when we look in, when we uh, are using, say, mouse models or cell lines, if we uh, transfect with a gene fusion, then we will produce a neoplastic disorder often. Uh, and silencing fusion transcripts will uh, reverse tumor, tumor genesis in model systems. So what kind of, uh, if we want to classify gene fusions, what kind of different classes can we come up with? One is uh, deregulation of a proto-oncogene. So this, uh, in the, the example here, is MYC fusing to IGH. IGH is regulatory elements. Uh, the five prime re regulatory elements get fused to the three prime axons of MYC, uh, producing a functional uh, MYC that's upregulated uh, because now it's, it's controlled by the regulatory elements of IGH. Uh, we can also have alternate forms of, of deregulation. For instance, recently discovered was uh, this MYB uh, fusion, which MYB is upregulated because its uh, three prime UTR is replaced. The three prime UTR contains microRNA binding sites, and then, and thus, uh, the cell is no longer able to regulate uh, MYB expression and tra uh, translation uh, through the microRNA binding uh, mechanism. So another uh, class of fusions is a formation of a chimeric hybrid uh, gene. This is where the, the, the fusion gene itself is more than just the sum of the two parts. So BCR, this is what BCR ABL1 is an example of. So uh, putting these two genes together produces a new gene with a sort of distinct function. Another way in which these uh, events can affect the biology of the cancer is this for instance, uh, 
you produce a gene fusion that's non-functional, and the original function of one of the partners perhaps was a tumor suppressor function. And I think one of the most uh, interesting examples I've seen recently is this example of an MYB QKI uh, rearrangement that uh, really all of all three of the mechanisms we just described come into play here. I mean, we've already seen MYB can lose a 5' UTR and, and be deregulated, so that's happening. We also are uh, we're, uh, disabling QKI, which is a tumor suppressor, uh, by cutting it in half with this rearrangement. And then the new uh, fusion gene, MYB QKI, has uh, uh, a distinct fusion gene function. So when we're thinking about uh, how to find these uh, events, so what are, the, what are the available types of evidence, what are the genomic effects uh, that we can look for, chimeric DNA sequence, chimeric mRNA sequence, and also changes in expression of the genes involved. So the discovery platforms started out, at the, at the starting point here uh, from, I guess it's uh, 60 years or so years ago, are cytogenetics. These are uh, labor intensive and low throughput, but they were the the techniques that originally led to discovering gene fusions and include chromosome banding analysis and, and spectral keratotyping, which basically enable us to look at a high level uh, which chromosomes are translocated. Although then uh, there's a lot of work uh, that has to go into uh, finding the actual genes that have been involved and disrupted. Uh, another technique that's cytogenetics uh, is fluorescence in situ hybridization, so fish. Uh, this is still quite relevant uh, for, uh, for fusion discovery, I'd say, because it's very useful as a uh, validation technique. And for this technique, we basically take probes that are targeting specific genes and fluoresce with different colors. Uh, we, um, and then we, we produce an image in which we can see whether or not two genes are coincident because they have two colors that are overlapping. As you can see here, uh, where we're showing the sort of uh, signal of BCR ABL, which is the green and red that's overlapping. OK, so I'll, I'll mention expression arrays as a discovery platform. And this is basically because uh, expression arrays were used to find the ETS pro, uh, fusions in prostate cancer, although uh, they were they were used to find that very big discovery, but now they're no longer used. I would say in this in this way, uh, specifically, I think RNA seq is used more than uh, expression arrays for fusion discovery. But uh, this sort of analysis was uh, there's what they did was they uh, looked for outlier expression of specific genes. And they found that ETV1 and ERG, uh, in the, so in the green parts of this histogram, uh, showed outlier expression. And, and that outlier expression was mutually exclusive across their samples. And then they were able to attribute that finding uh, to a translocation that translocated either of those genes next to a team for SS2. Um, this particular fusion is pretty important because it was the first, one of the first that was found in a solid tumor. Previously, uh, gene fusions were thought of as events that happened in sarcomas and blood, di blood disorders. So this got everyone pretty excited about trying to find other recurrent fusions in other solid tumors and be able to, uh, since solid tumors make up a vast majority of the morbidity due to cancer, perhaps there were uh, other fusions to discover in solid tumors. Genome sequencing has also been used to discover fusions uh, such as these in colorectal cancer. Uh, it's comprehensive, um, although one of the issues is we don't, whenever we, we, we find a breakpoint, as you guys did in the previous lab, we're not ever sure. So maybe it will, it will connect two genes, but we're not sure what the larger picture is. Uh, there could be other breakpoints. It could be a complex rearrangement or just an insertion, uh, leaving the genes intact. Uh, and we don't know whether or not the, the product is expressed. And then finally, mRNA sequencing is probably the platform of choice uh, to discover gene fusions. 
because it's inexpensive. It provides ex information about the expression of the genes involved. Uh, it gives you an exact nucleotide level prediction of the fusion uh, sequence. Um, although it, it uh, doesn't provide quite as much information as genome sequencing, it doesn't give you the translocation breakpoints, etc. Um, and it's been used not only, I mean, this, I'm just showing an example here of mass and notch fusions that were found in breast cancer, but it's been used to find many thousands of, of fusions in, in recent years. So this graph is showing uh, using guided approaches, we are sort of trundling along, finding maybe 50 fusions a year, and as soon as we started using mRNA sequencing, um, last, I guess it was 2014, we, there were reportedly discovered uh, 7,800 fusions. So, um, Uh, yes, uh, I guess if it's not being expressed at the time point that you, where you sample, uh, your, where you, when you take your sample, there's a question of whether or not it's relevant across, well, you know, I guess there's a question of evolution there too, because it could be uh, relevant within, and microenvironments, because it could be relevant in a specific microenvironment or after some selective pressure like a, a drug. Um, so those are things I, I guess you could miss the relevance to a specific environment. Yeah, I'm I guess sure. the question is expression of other drugs at all times. Yeah, yeah, that's something to be careful of. So uh, I'll just review how RNA seq is generated. Um, in general, with these sequencing platforms, you'll find this the, the way of specifically with Illumina. You, you often take some kind of different library preparation and tack it onto the, the, the regular uh, sequencing chemistry pipeline to get some kind of different other, other sequencing. In this, in this way, we're targeting um, the messenger RNA by first doing a pull down where we pull down anything with a poly A tail. Uh, and then we're doing reverse transcription to turn it into uh, cDNA. And then we're running just the regular Illumina protocol. Uh, where we fragment the cDNA, do a size selection step, and then sequence each end. Okay, so what happens when we do that, apply that to the transcriptome of a tumor sample? Uh, well, the first thing that ha is happening is we have, say, a rearrangement that combines chromosome A and B. Uh, the first thing that happens is we, uh, if we have a fusion between gene X and gene Y on A and B, then that fusion transcript will be uh, trans uh, transcribed, and then it, there will be the splicing machinery will take effect and will splice out the introns. And so, what we're actually sequencing is the, the transcript here shown in the middle. Uh, the way I've drawn it here is actually what uh, the, the way it takes place, the way this is, this happens in most of the functional fusions, and that is that. Most often, especially because the introns make up the vast majority of the, of the gene sequence, most often the translocation breakpoint happens within the intron of the uh, two genes. And then the actual genomic breakpoint is, is spliced out by the splicing machinery. So often what we are sequencing is not the actual genomic break, we're sequencing the, the uh, boundary between the two genes. The, at the exon boundaries. Then we sequence these transcripts, and we can get uh, three types of reads. Uh, the wild type reads, which are just reads that look uh, indistinguishable from reads that come from the wild type gene X and gene Y. Uh, what I call spanning reads, which are reads, uh, we talked about these type of reads, uh, I think, last uh, module. So spanning reads would be ones where the entire read on one side uh, maps to one gene, and on the other side to, to another gene. And then split reads, where uh, one end maps entirely to one gene, and the other end is sort of half and half gene X, gene Y. So to recover these events, we, broadly speaking, there's two possible ways to deal with this data. And one is alignment. Uh, I think that's predominantly what people do. 
I'll also mention assembly. So there's two opposite ways of doing this, uh, the way I think about it. Uh, the first is the, in the alignment-based approach, we are independently aligning each read and then clustering that data into, uh, into contigs or transcripts based on the alignment of those reads to the, to the reference genome. Uh, and that's this uh, path on the left. And with assembly, we are instead uh, first clustering the reads according to how similar they look, and then taking the resulting clustered reads, uh, turning them into longer contigs, and then aligning those to the reference genome. And the way that in which they are grouped together is just by looking at overlaps uh, between those reads and sort of tiling them out to make longer sequences. Okay, so I'm going to talk mainly about alignment because that's predominantly the, the methods that have been used to discover fusions thus far uh, in the literature. Um, so the, one of the problems here is, is again, splicing. Um, when we're trying to align RNA-seq data, especially when we're trying to look for fusions, we have two ways in which uh, we have to deal with uh, non-contiguous alignments of pieces of the reads. And one is because uh, our reads come from uh, transcript sequences, if we try to align these to the genome, then some of those reads will be split by the introns. So half of the read will map to, uh, to one exon and half to an adjacent exon. And then the other problem, that, of course, the reads that we're looking for that are split by the fusion, those one end will map to a gene x one to gene y. Uh, we can make our lives a little bit easier we assume we know all of the everything about the gene models. We can align just to the gene transcripts uh, sequences themselves, and that gets around the problem of aligning across introns. Um, but in in general, what people do is they align to both uh, a combined reference that is both the transcriptome and the genome. And here we're just showing that with transcript the, the in terms of mapping rates, which is what is shown on the left using the transcriptome and the genome, we are getting the highest mapping rates. Uh, in the middle here, this, this middle column is with no transcriptome, and we're getting poorer mapping rates. But, and definitely we're getting better using a transcriptome and genome reference over uh, just the transcriptome only. We're not mapping as many reads. Um, and the, on the right, we're showing similar uh, the similar situation for uh, the percentage of reads that cannot be mapped uniquely. Uh, for this, actually using, um, using just the transcript, transcriptome, um, and especially RefGene and UCSC, we get a lower number of reads that are, are not uniquely mappable. But this is at the expense of not being able to map a lot of the reads at all. So generally, a transcriptome and genome reference is preferable. And how about genome alone? Yes, so genome alone is, um, is this column. It's, it's a bit awkward of a figure, but yeah, so none down here means they're not using the transcript database at all. Yeah. And then same word over here. So on the left, we have uh, percentage of reads that you can map, and then on the right, percentage of the reads you can map uniquely. Um, or sorry, it's the other way around. It's a percentage of reads you cannot map uniquely. OK, so um, perhaps a lot of these tools, the tools that we'll talk about, the first step is to find uh, spanning reads. So this is reads that, uh, for where one end maps fully to the to gene X and one to gene Y, and this gives us sort of a preliminary information about the approximate region uh, where the breakpoint occurs, and just just in general tells us that perhaps there's an event involving gene X and gene Y. Uh, and this, uh, th but the, the problem with just this analysis is it doesn't give us an exact fusion transcript sequence. It just gives us approximately gene X and gene Y are somehow involved in a, in a fusion. And so the next step is always uh, 
in most of these tools is to uh, refine the, the approximate breakpoint that you breaking that you get from GeneX and GeneY by trying to find uh, reads that are exactly split by the fusion boundary. Um, and I think the, the earliest tools would do this by uh, taking all of the exons from GeneX and all of the exons from GeneY and just pairing them up in all possible combinations, and then just doing uh, a subsequent alignment step using, say, BWAMEM to align to all of those possible combinations and find out which uh, pair of exons is supported by um, a split read. Um, so that's one way you can do it. That's, uh, it, I guess there's other more refined ways that, uh, that have also been proposed. In general, this is a hard problem, though. Uh, I may have switched the slides around, the slide order around on you guys. Sorry about that. Um, so when we go from, from say, matching a subsequence exactly, that's sort of that's mostly a solved problem, um, and has been. Uh, so now there's algorithms can, that can do this quite quickly, and they can do it uh, within quite a bit less memory than previously using rest suffix rays, et cetera. Um, when we get to uh, more features that distinguish the read from the reference sequence, such as indels and mismatches, then this beca problem becomes a little bit harder. And then, then I would say the hardest problem is when you also have the possibility that subsegments map to different parts of the reference. So this is why. Um, the split read analysis just by itself is, is quite uh, difficult. So what people do, what tool, these tools do, is generally they uh, try to take the hard problem and turn it into the easier problem. So segment by segmenting the reads, basically uh, taking small subsegments and then trying to align each of those subsegments exactly. Uh, and so here we're taking this read at the top, uh, chopping it up into three pieces, uh, two of which map exactly, and then uh, to identify what the exact alignment is, then we sort of do a more refined analysis using the information about uh, where each of these segments map. So, the, and one way we can do that is to uh, use something called dynamic programming, which is the most sensitive way of producing an alignment, but it's also the most time consuming. And it's not something we can do uh, by to act. It's not possible, really, or tractable to take one read and dynamic programming, use dynamic programming to align it to the full uh, reference genome. So instead, what we can do is just based on the information that we've found from mapping these subsegments, uh, we can construct sort of a pseudo reference by taking the two genes uh, and putting them together approximately, and then using dynamic programming on this smaller pseudo-reference sequence. Um, sure. Yeah, that, yeah, definitely. Yes, so then uh, you inevitably want to be able to have a set of reads that are aligning exactly uh, across the, the fusion boundary. Because uh, I, especially with fusion, it's, it's pretty important to have the exact uh, transcript sequence uh, so that you can understand this function. Um, OK, so this table is more for a reference. Uh, it's, this is, there's, there's quite a lot of tools that will uh, do fusion discovery for you. Um, including my own, which is at the bottom here, called Diffuse. Um, and this is just showing you, uh, I'll describe the columns really briefly, so th which tools produce an exact sequence, which, use the, which tools use the strategy of, of breaking the read up into segments to get a better idea of what, uh, what the exact fusion sequence is, uh, which ones leverage paired end read information, uh, which one, and then which ones use this technique where they reconstruct the exact fusion sequence using an approximate reference or versus the other alternative, the earlier alternative, which is 
to combine all pairs of exons and try a regular alignment to those that database of all pairs of exons. Um, and then the last column just tells you uh, whether or not the, the secondary alignment to find split reads is uh, robust to say a split read that also has like say a small indel in it or a small mismatch. Um, so there are assembly based methods for um, for finding uh, gene fusions. So to assemble you can use something like Transibus or Trinity um, and then yeah, th then the process is basically to map the context that you produce from those assembly tools uh, using something like GMAP or BLAT and then finally post-process and trying to understand uh, which ones are, are false positives versus which ones are are true fusions uh, and there's a, a pipeline called Barnacle that will do that for you. Um, I think one of the problems we've had when using assembly techniques is uh, assembly techniques are they're good at producing uh, long sort of consensus contigs for the main uh, transcript in your uh, in your sample that is representing a particular gene, uh, but then the splice variance of those uh, of those transcripts and the uh, in some cases the the fusion transcript those are just resolved as very short uh, subsequences that sort of give the alternate path um, from, say, say you have gene A, you have a full transcript uh, reconstructed for gene A, and you have full transcript re reconstructed for gene B, and then the fusion information in the, the context that you get out of these tools is just a short subsequence of A and a short subsequence of B. Uh, and so then it's, it's just as difficult to find a fusion based on those short subsequences as it is to find a fusion based on the, the reads originally. So um, I think it's, the long and short of it is it's not a completely solved problem. So you're asking about heterogeneity and yeah. Um, heterogeneity is, I think it's, it's something that's tractable when looking at genome sequences because we expect some kind of, we have some coverage expectations. Um, we don't really have those with RNA-seq. Things uh, are expressed at drastically different levels that sometimes you, it's difficult to even uh, distinguish the normal population that contaminates your sample and the, the tumor population. So really, I, I don't think we're going to be under, able to understand heterogeneity from RNA-seq until we do single-cell RNA-seq. That's my opinion. Yep. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah, I have a whole sequence of slides on this. Okay, continuing on talking about all the different tools that are available, um, there have been a number of evaluations. I think that what comes out of these is that uh, a, a lot of the tools produce very numerous, uh, n the, the number of predictions that come out of them is sometimes very large, and most of those are likely false positives. Uh, this is showing a comparison between uh, six different tools. Top at Fusion here is is producing 136,000 gene fusions uh, that are predicted. Um, Diffuse, my own tool, is producing 915, which is not that's that's still probably too many to to troll through. Um, and uh, they have variable performance in terms of uh, pulling out which uh, all of the the actual gene fusions in the data set. Uh, that they're presenting here. Oh, so yes. So what what is the key here? I mean, um, oh, how do you know? So the ground truth here, I think, was they took a cell line and that was fairly well understood, 
in that they had done a lot of PCR experiments to try and you know, validate their fusions, and then just tried to understand how many of those fusions they that were rediscovered by these different tools. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and then on the right, I'm just showing here that's that's the main the main um, result from the simulations that they did in this paper is that they're not very reliable. At, uh, they're often simulations of RNA-seq data are often too perfect. Um, yeah, I guess I think there were 19 original fusions, and Chimera's scan found, identified all of them in this data set, although it did produce 13,000 other predictions. So there's a question of sensitivity versus specificity there. It's not the most uh, specific. Yes, um, this is a, it's, uh, it's a bit confusing, and I would just look at the all, because what they've done here is they've tried to uh, look at which tools produce a, a prediction of, uh, this is the five prime gene and this is the three prime gene. Uh, but a lot of tools don't even bother making that prediction, so I don't think that the, that part of the results has any validity. So it's not. Um, okay. So, um, RNA seq, I would say it's it. In my opinion, it's, uh, it's a pretty difficult type of data to work with. There's a lot of different. Uh, you can look at. Uh, uh, data that comes from different cell types will have different artic artifacts because a whole new gene set of genes are being predicted, and it's, it, it is quite uh, tricky. So I'll just list some of the different sources of false positives that come th through in this data because often you'll have to uh, you'll do some predictions, and then you're only really a quarter of the way there because you have to try and understand um, where the false positives are coming from and filter things down. Um, the technical artifacts here are alignment artifacts. So you could have two genes that are quite similar, and uh, so you have A and A prime, and one end of maps to A, and the other end has a mismatch that um, instead of mapping next door to A, in, in A it maps to A prime. So you can have things like that where homologous genes produce a lot of artifacts. And then that is confounded by high expression. So if you have uh, a lot of reads uh, produced by uh, a particular gene, perhaps there's some, uh, a, a few, a small percentage of those reads have errors in them that will cause those reads to map to another part of the genome and, and nominate a gene fusion. So that's something to be careful of. Um, we can get within the chemistry, we can, there's, there's ways in which we can get what look like chimeric reads during reverse transcription. Uh, you can get template switching and during, uh, also during the library preparation, you can have reads or pieces of sequence that randomly ligate together. The good thing about these types of artifacts is they are quite random and so just by uh, clustering reads together and filtering things that have very low read support you can usually remove things that, uh, that are produced in the chemistry. Um, also you need to mention biological artifacts such as natural sources of rearrangement, so Ig rearrangements uh, transposons, nuclear mitochondrial insertions, things like this uh, produce uh, are sources of rearrangement just naturally and they can often be mistaken for gene fusions. Yes? I would have a mixed answer to that. So do you, if you increase the depth, do you get more artifacts or less artifacts? Uh, some of the artifacts are definitely generated by regions with very high depth. Uh, and then subsequent to having a lot of reads in this, in this one region, so if you have a, even a tiny percentage of reads that don't map correctly, that's still going to look like a lot of read support for a false positive fusion. But if you do have higher coverage, then you can have a higher threshold on uh, things like recount. And so you can get rid of some of the more random artifacts. But 
always when you're doing more depth, you have to worry about if there's some um, confounding factor that is uh, is non-random. So things that are randomly distributed, those will just be filtered out if you uh, as background noise. But things that are completely non-random, if there's some pro process that's uh, taking reads and putting them in a specific location uh, because of a specific, uh, say, uh, repeat or something, then those won't get any better the more you sequence. Yes, and the, the last thing I'm, I'll, I will mention about biological artifacts is transcription-induced chimeras or read-throughs. Um, so these happen in, in benign tissue and in, in tumor tissue. So you get pairs of genes that, uh, because perhaps the, the chromatin is open, uh, those genes end up being transcribed together. And then the splicing machinery splice them, slices them as if it's a regular gene. And you essentially get a very long gene that's basically two adjacent genes. All right, so dealing with alignment artifacts first, um, how, do we, um, how do we identify these and just robustly filter them out? Um, the approach we used with diffuse was to uh, train a classifier on, well, the first thing we did was to predict a number of fusions and pick things uh, what, uh, as best as we could randomly so that we could understand, and then validate them. And, and then, um, so that we can understand which what the signal is for a false uh, positive and what the signal is for a true positive. Um, and then the next step was to train a classifier that could do uh, the filtering automatically for us. And I'll just briefly describe some of the indicators of an artifact. And these are presented in order of sort of their importance according to training a classifier. Um, so the first is whether or not uh, the reads that you've aligned to uh, the fusion transcript stack up all in the same place or whether or not they tile uniformly across your fusion boundary. So if they're tiling uh, at different uh, locations across your fusion boundary, then this is a good, indica a good indicator of a good prediction. Uh, so in the histogram we here, we're showing um, how uh, towards the right, we're showing uh, well distributed across the fusion boundary, and towards the left, not well distributed, so all in, all in one place on the left here. And then red is the false positives, and green is the true positives. Uh, another signal of a, of a good prediction is whether or not at the fusion boundary we have a, a canonical uh, splice site signal. So this is the, the splicing machinery looks for the signal of GT at one end and AT at the other and removes that as a neutron. So that is a good indicator of a true positive. Um, if we cannot uniquely assign most of the reads on one, at one end to one gene, then that's another good indicator that um, if they have many mapping, if one, especially if one end always has many other mappings, for the reads that support our fusion, then that's a sign that we have a false positive. Uh, another thing that people do is reconstruct a fusion transcript. Uh, this is something people do with both when they're using both assembly and uh, alignment-based approaches. So you reconstruct your fusion transcript, and then you realign your reads back to that fusion transcript. And the ones that span or are split by the fusion boundary, you look basically at whether or not those reads have the same length distribution as your wild type reads. Uh, finally, uh, analogous to how split reads distribute across your, your fusion boundary, we can look at how spanning reads, whether or not they align all in one place or are well distributed across your fusion boundary. Um, so, sorry, what is the question? So, what, what is the, the difference between those two? Because this should, this examines for well distributed or normal distribution of. Yeah, totally. Okay. And straddle 
Yeah, so this one is looking at uh, how long are the fragments when you map them back to the... Yeah, so what is the insert size when you map them back to the fusion transcript? And the, and the other one is just looking at how well do they uh, distribute across the fusion boundary there. Okay, and finally, uh, the last indicator of an artifact is something uh, that's a little bit tricky, but if we look at the uh, how well each side of the fusion maps back to the genome, uh, a good indicator of a, good, of a, a solid fusion prediction is that we can uh, take the fusion transcript that's predicted and divide it into one half that goes to one gene and the other half that goes to another gene almost precisely um, with, with a distinct fusion boundary. And in comparison to that, it's possible that say 75% starting at the, at the beginning maps to one gene. So the first 75% maps to one gene and the last 75% maps to the other gene. And then we have this big chunk in the middle that could go either way, it could go to gene A or gene B. So that particular, uh, if, if that's true, then that's often an indicator that uh, of an alignment artifact producing, producing a gene fusion. If we, so if you take two random sequences, uh, or sorry, if you take two random subsequences of the genome, and then you concatenate them together, and then you align them back to the genome, you wouldn't expect much of the sequence from this location to be able to align also to this location, right? Just by random chance. So maybe you would expect a couple nucleotides from sequence B to also be able to, to map to sequence A. But then, uh, unless there, there's quite a lot of uh, repetitiveness to that sequence at the fusion boundary, should map uniquely, if that makes sense. So far apart by neutrons, so, like, so far all separated by like, introns, and that's what spliced out, and that's why there's no proper variations. Yeah. yeah. If, well, if there's actually yeah, we'll get some uh, experience in the lab with with this kind of thing. Yeah, no. Right, it has to be has to be exact. So it gets back. So I think it's the exact. Yes, but by chance you could have, say, and you know you could have sequence A, uh, sequence A, sequence B. This could have a, have a T at the end of it that could map equally well at this low side or this low side, giving some ambiguity in where the fusion boundary is. But um, yeah, we'll, we can work through that in the, in the uh, tutorial, though. OK, so for natural sources of rearrangement, I think the thing to do here is to annotate as comprehensively as you can uh, things that you predict from databases such as uh, repeat masker, IG gene lists, and be able to filter out things that you identify as uh, not necessarily gene fusions, but sources uh, from sources of rearrangement other than uh, chromosomal translocations. And then uh, read throughs are easily identified because they are involving adjacent genes, so those can be flagged. To prioritize uh, candidates uh, from any prediction tool, uh, we can look at expression. So how highly uh, expressed is specifically the three prime gene that may, is often the gene with, uh, that provides most of the function to a gene fusion. And then whether or not, if we look across the expression across of the exons across each of the genes, is there a change in expression at the, the fusion boundary? Uh, if, if the fusion itself is much more highly expressed than either of the wild type genes, then you should expect the three prime exons of one gene to be highly expressed and the five prime exons of the other gene to be highly expressed. 
recurrence, we can look at uh, whether or not either the uh, same fusion pair has been identified across our cohort or whether or not uh, one gene is, is consistently fused to other genes across our cohort. And we, if we have whole genome data, we can also look for corroborating rearrangement. Um, we can look at gene function. So has the, the gene been implicated in cancer? Does it involve a kinase? Uh, could it serve as a drug target? That may be something uh, that you would want to annotate your, your data set with. Um, And also, um, is the function of your gene fusion preserved, or of your fused gene, does it preserve, uh, does your fusion preserve the original function of the two genes? And this can be done by looking at domains. Uh, one of the most important things, though, is whether or not, uh, when you fuse these two genes together, uh, whether or not it preserves the reading frames of each of those uh, genes. Uh, because there's ways in which they can fuse, and uh, the, especially the, uh, the three prime gene, uh, when translated, will become nonsense and will not be the original uh, peptide sequence that comes out of that uh, translation of that part of the gene. When looking at uh, what the gene fusion partners are that are consistently fused, uh, often the ones we know that are functional are tyrosine kinases, is one class of gene fusions. Transcri transcription factors is another class that are commonly fused. This is, includes the, the ones that were found in prostate cancer and oncogenes that are upregulated. We can also build uh, a network of uh, the gene fusions that have been found uh, that to date. This, this actually network was produced, uh, I guess it was nine years ago, uh, in this sort of survey paper. And uh, what they found was that the fusions were highly connected to a, a few, in a few clusters centered around a few genes. And in this paper, they postulated that maybe uh, with a lot more work on gene fusions, we'll be able to connect all of these clusters, to, these three clusters specifically together to form sort of a, uh, a, a single network of gene fusions, which is not actually what ended up happening. Um, when we look at something like ovarian cancer, uh, a lot of work has been done on s since that uh, original picture on trying to identify gene fusions. And what they find is uh, generally these the, the gene fusion network is very disconnected. Uh, one of the reasons for that is just the guided approaches that they were using for gene fusion networks uh, before they started doing sequencing. And the other reason is because possibly a lot of these fusions are non-functional and created by genomic instability. Um, we've, there's been some landscape papers that have um, happened very recently where they've sequenced a lot of tumors and looked for patterns of, of fusions across these cancers. Um, and what they do find is they find a lot of the fusions are associated with copy number change. Uh, and perhaps that is a sign that a lot of the new, newly discovered gene fusions are passengers and the product of uh, genome instability. I'll mention a couple of, uh, of these of, uh, of the databases that are available that provide uh, some details about gene fusions that have already been discovered. TCGA Gene Fusion Portal. That's actually the uh, produces provides all of the data that has been uh, identified and associated with this uh, fusion landscape paper. Uh, so you can query that. Uh, you can't download it, unfortunately. Um, you can also look at COSMIC, which has a, a more restricted set of gene fusions that are curated from publications. That one is downloadable. Uh, ChimerDB pulls together a, a number of different sources, and is, uh, I, I would say it's one of the most useful ones. Uh, and ConjoinedG is a database primarily for uh, conjoined genes in healthy tissues, so uh, read-throughs. Okay, continuing on. Uh, uh, the vein of, of what to look for in terms of function of a gene fusion. Um, one of the things we can do is, again, look at the expression across the exons of your 
uh, fusion of, of your genes that are involved in your gene fusion. And here, for instance, we're showing that for this particular gene fusion, R3, uh, CRAD, and this other one involving HNF1A, uh, if you look across the, the expression of each of those genes, then you see a very stark uh, change point when you get to the breakpoint. And that's showing that there's really no wild type expression of, uh, of the wild type gene. All of the expression is coming from um, the fusion gene. Uh, we can look, sure. Yep. Um, so there's been, what's happened is there's been a translocation exactly at that break point. And either, you know, you can think of this almost as a deletion, that whole end of that. Uh, of that transcript could actually be, maybe it doesn't even exist anymore in, in the sample. Or perhaps it's translocated somewhere else, and where it's been translocated, uh, tra translocated to, uh, there's no promoter that would actually lead to expression of those sequences. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. So you would, yeah, that's exactly what, this is exactly what you would see, uh, say, if for, uh, for three in the top, say it was uh, split by some kind of genome shattering event. Uh, but maybe it's, uh, it's translocated somewhere, not as part of a gene fusion, it's just moved uh, to another part of the genome, and the five prime sequence is perhaps nonsense. So that wouldn't, I guess we wouldn't class that as a gene fusion. It would just be a, a gene disruption. Uh, but that can definitely happen. Yeah. And it would look the same as this. So, I mean, really what we'd have to do is look at part three, and also what we're not showing is what the expression of CRAD is. Uh, and we would expect that you would see just the five prime exon, or sorry, the three prime exons expressed for CRAD. So we would have to do this game where we match up the two genes expressions. Uh, okay, so I might go a bit faster uh, so that we can get to the tutorial quickly. Um, so here I'm just, just in this slide I'm just describing that you know we, if we look across different cancers we could end up finding perhaps the same uh, fusion partner that is fused to many other different genes. Uh, but is, is relevant in, in the same way to all of these diverse uh, tumor types, and that's what they found uh, for BRAF, for prostate, and several other uh, cancer types. Um, when we're looking for read-throughs, we have to be quite wary that, okay, so they are uh, a very recurrent, including in benign tissue, they're a very recurrent real event. Uh, at the bottom here we're showing all of the read-throughs and, and the histogram of how many samples they're found in. And then at the top the ones, the events that are not read-throughs. And the only thing that's recurrent here is TMPRSS2 ERG, which is our known biologically relevant, uh, uh, our biologically relevant fusion in prostate cancer, which is what these samples are. Uh, we have to be careful if we're just blanket filtering things out because uh, we could end up removing something that's either produced by a small deletion, which is what I'm showing uh, in this part of the slide on the right. Uh, so we, we have things that are recurrent on the bottom that are read-throughs, shown by this annotation, blue annotation. And then we have things at the top that are specific to our one cell line that are shown with the green annotation as rearrangement-based. And then we have this one event that is both a read-through and produced by a rearrangement, and is very specific to this sample. Uh, so clearly being adjacent doesn't mean, just because uh, gene fusion is predicting uh, a fusion of two adjacent genes, it doesn't mean it's going to be uh, produced 
specifically because those genes are adjacent. There needs to be something else going on sometimes. Yeah, it, uh, it potentially. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm not sure that's the case for this example that I showed, but um, also uh, there's at least one example of a gene fusion that is a read through that uh, has been has had some implication in uh, prostate cancer biology, and that's this SLC45A3L4. Uh, that is on the right here. We're showing uh, that it has the, the this tissue specificity of uh, expression of this gene fusion is due to the specificity of the expression of SLC forty five A three, and also it's been shown to uh, have some role in cell proliferation in prostate cancer. Uh, Another feature we can look at when we're trying to understand the biology of these fusions is uh, how the splicing, uh, where in the, each of the genes the, the splicing happens when we're splicing together these two genes to, to make a gene fusion. Um, I'm going to just skip over this slide. And I think one of the most interesting uh, things we can calculate is whether or not the gene fusion is, hasn't preserved open reading frame across the fusion transcript. So if we bring together two, two transcript sequences, uh, about, I guess it's one in nine times, we will have this situation where the codons exactly line up. And uh, in that situation, then we'll preserve all of the codons uh, when they're translated, will be the original codons of the original transcript sequences. We can also, two out of nine times, we have the situation in which um, we get a nonsense codon right at the fusion boundary, but uh, we, these things are brought together in such a way that uh, the remaining uh, three prime codons are the original codons of the three prime gene. And then also, uh, two thirds of the time, at least the majority of the time, we have a situation in which all of the three prime codons are just uh, nonsense. So if we look for these two situations at the top, then that's, uh, if we see something, if we see a prediction that looks like uh, what we see the situation at the bottom, then that's a sign that there's no, not going to be any uh, biological function that's preserved. Yeah. Um, but the, for the first two events, oh, uh, so I guess potentially in this, this situation on the right at the top, uh, if, you, yeah, you could end up with a codon that's, yeah, it could be the same as the original one from gene A or gene B, but, um, yeah, it's true. Okay, so we can look in the in the the genome for evidence that will sort of help us understand these events. Uh, here, I'm I'm showing at the bottom a way in which we should be, or just some evidence that we should be careful when we're doing this, because uh, what I'm showing is a fusion transcript between SAMD12 and this PHF gene. Uh, so the fusion transcript is at the top involves these two genes. But in the genome, what we actually had that produced this fusion transcript is a translocation between those two genes. But at the breakpoint, we have the insertion of a 1KB sequence from another part of the genome and a 1KB sequence from a third part of the genome. So uh, if we are looking just at individual breakpoints, we'll never see SAMD12 directly connected to PHF. Uh, and yet, in the transcriptome, that's that's what we see. 
So sometimes you have to count for the complexity of the breakpoints when you're looking for corroborating evidence, evidence in the genome. So you don't have the classical weeks here, how do you If you don't have the classical reads? So yeah, you'll never find reads that uh, in the genome that connect SAMD12 and PHF, because unless you have very long reads, uh, which isn't the case with the sequencing data most of the time. So I mean, what we did for this is we had to look for uh, paths through the genome graph. To from so we we're looking for a path that goes from SAMD12 via some other path through the genome to PHF. Um, and this top example is an example of uh, a complex rearrangement that produces multiple gene fusions. So this happens in prostate cancer where you have uh, the DNA gets cut at uh, four different locations, permuted, and then rejoined to produce uh, two gene fusions on two different chromosomes. Okay, considerations when you're... Uh, so designing experiments, I would say if you have a large cohort size, then some, some of these tools are a bit prohibitive in terms of their computational costs. So you can use some simpler methods, uh, such as the methods that uh, don't do a sort of a refined alignment. They just join pairs of exons and do a standard alignment, things like that. And then filter recurrent artifacts. Uh, if we know a fusion partner, then you can often do a, a capture experiment is more efficient. Um, artifacts are very prevalent, so we have to be very careful when we're uh, getting excited about finding uh, an, an event. We should always, I would say, spot check individual events is, is really important and, and manually check supporting reads. Uh, as we've seen, it's important with SMBs and other events and rearrangements to do that in IGB. It's the same with gene fusions. Um, leverage, definitely leverage multiple computational methods and uh, validation is always important, at least for a subset of pure predictions. So for our recent advan advances, uh, I think this happened last year, Krizotinib passed uh, phase three trials, so we're starting to uh, make some gains clinically from uh, being able to identify gene fusions and then treat them with drugs. And finally, uh, future research in gene fusions, I think, is going to look at how they affect the, the proteome. Uh, and one of, the new tool, one of the tools that people are starting to use for this is uh, mass spec data. And, uh, and so now, what I think what we're going to do, unless anyone has any questions.